second one. Time Magazine named Donald Trump Person of the Year. How nice. They see him as a person. <laughs> Usually he's just a stick of butter. I wonder if Mr. Trump sees it as a great honor. It's a great honor. It means a lot, uh, especially me growing up reading Time Magazine. And, you know, it's a very important magazine. And I've been uh, lucky enough to be on the cover many times this year so uh, and last year. But I consider this a very, very great honor. Not so fast, Donald. Here's the article's opening graph. Quote, we have named the person who had the greatest influence for better or worse. So which is it this year, better or worse? Nice setup. Why not paint an eye patch on him? Compare that treatment to this on people. Look at that. Aww. Or this. Remember that? Oh, yeah. I get it. Trump's nobody's nice guy. But what pick would they prefer? Hmm. Sorry. Donald Trump won. Here's why. He became president not just against all odds, but by uprooting tradition. He's an historical first, exploiting social media, a bare-knuckled comic in an entertainment bubble. He did something many dreamt of trying, slaying the beast called political correctness. He jammed the left-wing weaponry. Charges of racism, intolerance, sexism, hate, they stopped working. Trump said to his accusers, so what? Come and get me. And when they did, he already had millions of Americans behind him. Trump attracted so many people who were either victims of PC malice or just sick of hearing about it. 2016 saw more than the birth of a rare politician, but the death of identity politics. The pendulum swing from phobias over pronouns to jobs, migration policies, and Mr. Obama's unspeakable fear, radical Islam. It was about turning outward instead of inward, country, not campus. Maybe others could have done it, but Donald Trump did. Yeah, he said some crazy stuff. But that's the risk we're willing to take in 2016. In the next four years, we'll find out if it's worth it. You know, KG, yeah. I'm kind of sad that he didn't get man of the person of the year because the tweets would have been great. Oh my goodness gracious! Uh, look, I mean, he kind of—he's the one, isn't yeah. he? I mean, it's kind of honest, obvious. Why, it'd be a total diss if you picked anybody <laughs> else. else. It's really true, to yeah. be honest, because it is the most like miraculous thing that's happened in politics. He's definitely rewritten all the rule books mm -hmm. about how to win in politics, about how to use social media, about how to go around the press and get it done yourself. He figured out a way to scale the media wall that usually. Really, that the barricade cheese him, the cheese grater, the Dana Bruno <laughs> cheese grater, and get around it and reach the people themselves directly. He took his case directly to the American voter, and they loved it. Mm -hmm. Eric, I'm surprised they didn't name President Obama for the third time. They, they, they tried to. <laughs> and they, you know who the well, runner-up like, was? Hillary Clinton. Yes. So if they're going to make her the runner-up, he had to be the winner. Funny that the editor said, and she was on the Today Show right before Donald Trump spoke on the yeah. Today Show, she said never did they have a more unanimous vote than this time that Donald Trump was going to be the person of the year. But then she went on to say never have they been more split on whether it was going to be good or a good thing or a bad <laughs> thing. I thought that was interesting. But he, uh, look. Everything Kimberly said is 100% right. He flipped the script on D.C. He turned the deplorables, he gave the deplorables a voice, and a voice they haven't had. And what you had said, he crushed PC, and, and I love that idea. He got rid of gender politics, at least for now. But think about this. He won where no one thought he could win. He won in Pennsylvania. He won in Michigan. He won in Wisconsin. North Carolina. He, he, he won white women by 9% when people were saying he can't win with women. Granted, white women, I get it. Hispanics, 28%. I mean, people were saying he can't win Hispanics. 28%. That, that's, that's a great number. Mm -hmm. um, African Americans. Mm -hmm. He got 8% or 9% of African Americans, and that, that mirrors what Romney and McCain did combined. So, look, the guy. The guy changed politics. And, and 200, you guys keep pointing this 200 out. 200 counties that things, President Barack Obama won, he was able to take this th time. Things that have been normal in politics for 250 years or 245 years, whatever it is, uh, are change is coming. Yeah. Dana, I, I, one of the other reasons, his frank assessment of radical Islam, you could argue that his prescription may be off, you could argue about that, but his diagnosis was real and sincere. And I think even Democrats and liberals admit that at this point that like you know what maybe if our side had just been honest about this we might have had a chance having a clear eyed being very clear eyed about the threat right. and being willing to say it yeah because there is a hesitation i know that you know i don't i am one a person who is fearful of offending people mm -hmm. um, 
and maybe I shouldn't be, no. but I actually kind of just kind of am. I always <laughs> have been. Um, the other thing about this, in terms of that opening graph of how they have the cover, is, it's a really nice cover too. They didn't do as like some sort of like crazy picture of him. Like it's a really nice portrait. But the opening graph suggests that um, you know maybe it's not such a good thing as Eric's pointing out. They're divided about that. But the more that the left paints him as this evil, crazy person, the more his approval numbers go up because yeah. most of the country is saying, "I have an open mind. Let's wait and see." And they're mm -hmm. kind of enjoying this transition period. One thing, Juan, that I don't Great understand. Time. The press should be kind of happy. I mean, th this is not Ted Cruz. This is not a right-wing apocalypse. If you look at, at, the, at the kind of the, the things that are going on now with trade, social issues, Huntsman being brought up, uh, he's got the... He, Donald Trump did what Barack Obama could never do. He pushed the Republicans to the middle. Yeah, well, that's interesting. That's an interesting point because I think right now the Democrat strategy in Washington is in large part to play along with Trump on a lot of these issues, especially with regard to entitlement spending, Obamacare, exactly what's Trump willing to do that's not in keeping with what the Republican establishment, Republican orthodoxy have been on Capitol Hill. This would be interesting to watch that play out. But getting back to the time cover, look, he's no Martin Luther King Jr. He's not Gandhi, right? And of course, not President, yet, Juan. I don't, I don't think it's coming. Not yet. Uh, and I think Clinton, Bush, Obama all were man of the year, the year they yeah. won the presidency. And he deserves that. The thing about it is, when he was asked this morning about being a divisive candidate, because on the cover it says, you know, leader uh, of a divided well, Can I America. show that? Sure, Let's, go right ahead. Uh, this is Donald Trump talking about uh, to uh, times accusing him of being divisive. When you say divided states of America, I didn't divide them. They're divided now. I mean, there's a lot of division. And we're going to put it back together, and we're going to have a country that's very well healed. And we're going to be a great economic force, and we're going to build up our military and safety, and we're going to do a lot of great things, and uh, it's going to be something very special. But to be on the cover of Time magazine as the person of the year is a tremendous honor. So why? Well, I think he took it as a tremendous honor. He invited the writer up to his uh, pension as palace in the sky, yeah. right? Um, but I must say, I think that he magnified divisions in the country. Uh, and, he, and he's brought a new level of fear and outrage among people. I mean, when you think of the whole issue that you raised, which was he blew apart political correctness. Yes. The other side of blowing it apart is I think you have seen the degrading of civility, the degrading of... That's, the, of, that's the risk, though, but the, it was about time because nobody had ever shown up to do that. Oh, I don't think well, that's true. And he didn't true. start it. Oh, I think, I think that he... Ex, he ex, exaggerated yeah. the divisions within the society. I mean, exactly. And I think exaggerated too. No, no. I mean, exacerbated is fine, but I think he exaggerated them because I don't think America is as dark and fearful a place as the one he presented. Unless you, you know, step out in line. Like, if you work at Fox News, you know how divisive the media can be when you have organizations coming after and, you. And who was more divisive in the last month of, of uh, leading up to the election than Hillary Clinton? She had no policy. All she had was, he's terrible. Here's why you shouldn't vote for him. He's, and, he's being backed by this group. They're deplorable. They're, deplorable, they're racist. Yeah. They're sexist. They're misogynist. They're, they're Islamophobic. They're isms. They're redeemable. The, they're, the, the whole gender, the whole identity politics, that's all she played. She didn't come up with anything, anything that was pro-American, and he did. He kept saying, we're going to make America great again, we're going to bring jobs back, and his message resonated. While she divided, he was, I, you know, I think his message was united. You know, was I, uniting. Think, I think you get lost in the idea that he won, and it's incontrovertible, he <laughs> won the Electoral College map. But if you're talking about American... <laughs> think I, lost, I think he won. lost on me. <laughs> right. But, but, but what, when well, you're talking about her and the popular vote, she won not close. She won by a lot. Can yeah, I quote a friend of mine? Take two states out. Take two states out. Well, let me finish responding to you. You say, oh, she didn't have a message. She did have a message, apparently. Yeah. Two and a half million more Americans than Donald Trump agreed with her. Two coast message. She just forgot about the rest of the life. New York counties, because it's a highly populous area. Can I just address this? Tyrus, who's a professional wrestler, said it best. It's like saying you won the game because you got the most yards. It's about the most points, not the most yards. And that's what that's what the votes were. You got the most yards, but you didn't score the most. Kimberly. Whether it's passing yards or rushing yards. Yes. Thank you very much. Kicking yards. All right, so. Kick Darius? No. No, there's no kicking yards. Sorry, almost so bad. I knew that. To the cheese grater. Well, I like it. Okay. Okay, you want to say something? Huh? Sure. All right, so he didn't create the divide, and right when we were listening yeah. to that, and Dana had said it and echoed it and said that flat out, 
the divide was already here. We have been watching, we have been talking about, we have been reporting on the divide that has been going on across this country. But he found a way to bridge the divide, mm -hmm. to be able to talk to people, to reach out for those that felt that they were forgotten, those Americans that are hardworking, that make up the fabric of this society. And the people that are saying, wait, has anybody listened to us in so long? Mm -hmm. Some of the same people that thought there was going to be hope and change with Barack Obama and felt they got shortchanged were ready and the first in line to get paid by Trump. Well, Honestly, I think there are wait. people who feel, who feel, you know what, we are left behind, forgotten, and they feel as if Trump, okay. in fact, demonized them in order to uh, get going. Let me do before we wait, finish. Can I just steal? No, oh, I want to get to Dana because I, I think that this whole division thing is somewhat exaggerated by the fact that you have two factions. You have two parties. Of course, it's going to be divisive when it's over. One side lost. It's built so, that way. It's built that way. In fact, the, 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 it's kind of like the smoke that comes out of the chimney. It's, uh, the, the fire are the two parties, and the smoke is just reflects what happens after an election. You have one party that loses, one party that wins. It's naturally a divisive feeling, but that's the way it goes. Well, it's polarizing. If I, I would imagine, and Juan can correct me, but when the Reagan Democrats decided to vote Republican, I mean, there was a similar thing, right? So yeah. there was divisions, and then Ronald Reagan was able to, to get them to vote for him. Then it goes back to... Uh, then you have uh, Bush, Clinton, Bush, right. Obama, Trump. I mean, like, it's a pattern that we see as repeated. But well, I don't what, think what I he think was able works. to do, though, what he was able to do is, is, is see that that outsider thing was all, not only good for him on the Republican side, he saw an opportunity to pull some of those outsider yeah. voters who were sick of the, the establishment on the Democrat side and pull some of those Bernie Sanders voters. I, don't, I haven't that's seen the true. number, that's but I think he probably did better among Democrats than maybe the last few Republicans. I would certainly uh, think better. No, I, I don't know. I, I could be wrong, but my guess would be that Trump did better among Democrats than Romney did or McCain did. Probably. And that was probably the reason why he won. We're in the process of putting together one of the all-time great cabinets that has ever been assembled in our nation's history. Uh, President-elect Trump and Vice President-elect Pence have met with over 70 or 75 men and women, um, not all of whom will end up in the cabinet or are they seeking to, but really very appreciative of their counsel, their advice, their experiences, and their vision for this nation. All right, that was Kellyanne Conway, the senior Trump advisor, speaking on Fox News earlier today, preceded, of course, by her boss, talking about putting together one of the all-time great cabinets. Uh, let's look at how that cabinet is now shaping up. Uh, just in the past 24 hours or so, we are getting word of a bunch of new picks by Mr. Trump, including Iowa Governor Terry Branstad as the U.S. Ambassador to China, uh, retired Marine Corps General John Kelly as the Secretary of Homeland Security, according to him. Uh, Oklahoma Attorney General Scott Pruitt, a critic of the EPA, is now in line to be nominated as the EPA Administrator. And Linda McMahon, former wrestling executive and former Senate candidate, uh, is now are going to be nominated as the administrator for the Small Business Administration. Uh, also in today's news, Time Magazine named Donald Trump as its Person of the Year, uh, but also adding in its headline right there on the front of the magazine, you can see it, President of the Divided States of America. All right, let's go talk about this with our panel. Syndicated columnist George Will, A.B. Stoddard, Associate Editor at Real Clear Politics, and Charles Hurt, political columnist for The Washington Times. George Will, we begin with you. What do you make of this Time Magazine cover? That's obviously right. I mean, it's an easy call. It's supposed to be the person who dominated the news. The first one they had in 1927 was Charles Lindbergh, a few hours over the Atlantic, but he did dominate the news. 1936, I'll give you 20 guesses, you won't guess who it was. Wallace, Wallace Simpson. If you've been watching The Crown, you know that it was a, a big deal at that time. So it's a good choice by, by them, and it, um, it, time has, on some years, just sort of thrown up its hands because the year just wasn't dominated by someone. In 1982, that was the computer. In 1966, it was Americans under 26. Uh, in 2006, they put a little mirror on the cover, and the, and the person of the year was you. It was a tribute to our national narcissism, I guess. <laughs> but uh, th this was, I say, was a very easy choice. The man rewrote the rules, dominated the year. Good for him. 
I, one has to imagine Hillary Clinton agrees, although she might decide that the, the people who were most decisive in this election were probably James Comey and Vladimir Putin and, and Julian Assange. Uh, sometimes Time Magazine doesn't always flatter the person they choose as man of the year. In 1972, when Richard Nixon won re-election with 49 states, they put a paper mache of his head, and it wasn't the most flattering image of the man. A.B., what do you make of this headline, President of the Divided States of America? Right, well, it, and Donald Trump loves being named Person of the Year. It's a big deal to him. He thought that was a little bit, a little bit snarky, he said, the divided states of America. Was he right? Um, it, it is, and the copy um, in, in the story is about basically, you know, it's, it's not flattering per se. There's a lot of criticism woven into there. Um, but it's, um, it's Donald Trump um, in all of his dominating. Um, and George is right. He dominated the year, and it was an obvious choice. They wouldn't have picked anybody. They couldn't have picked anybody else. Um, and Donald Trump um, does not hide his delight at being picked at the time person of the year. Uh, Mr. Trump conducted a telephone interview with the Today Show on NBC this morning in which he discussed his continuing deliberations over uh, the person who will serve as his Secretary of State. Let's listen to that. Let me go back to Mitt Romney. Is he still under consideration? Yes, he is. Does he have a chance to become Secretary of State? Yes, he does. I mean, I've, I've spoken to him a lot. Uh, we've come a long way together. We had some tremendous uh, difficulty together, and now uh, I think we've come a long way. All right, Charlie Hurt, uh, what do you make of the continuing deliberations over the Secretary of State job? We've got ambassadors to the U.N. named, we have ambassadors to China named, but those people don't know who their boss at the State Department is going to be yet. Well, if he does pick Mitt Romney, you, you, Mitt Romney will have earned it uh, for all the times that he's had to sort of uh, bow and scrape and go to Bedminster uh, to, to uh, kiss the ring. Um, but, you know, I, and I, from the beginning, I I've thought that it was a, a very distinct possibility that he, that, that he could uh, possibly uh, pick him, uh, but for a host of reasons, and not the least of which is that Donald Trump does kind of want to prove that he can uh, make good with people that he has, has had big fights with in the past. Um, one of the things that I think is particularly interesting about that Time uh, Man of the Year thing is that at least Time Magazine has not learned the lesson about Donald Trump because they also uh, took, the, not only did they have the, the phrase about the divided uh, states of America, but they all, Nancy Gibbs at the beginning, the managing editor, wrote this forward in which she called him a huckster, an addict, a fabulist, and a demagogue. And, and now people may all agree that these are all accurate terms, but this is a, it, it's, it, it's hardly, uh, you know, it's, it's hardly a fair uh, way to, to, to uh, describe a guy that it's just yeah. one, uh, the president. It's, it's not reminiscent of Herblock's clean shave uh, for <laughs> President Nixon. Where Donald Trump once boasted of knowing more than the generals tonight as president-elect, he is fairly surrounding himself with retired military leaders, with all indications that he is planning to name a third general for a key position in his administration. This occurs as Time magazine names Mr. Trump its person of the year. Correspondent Peter Ducey is at his usual spot tonight outside Trump Tower in Midtown Manhattan. Good evening, Peter. Good evening, James. That's right. The president-elect has another general in mind for a key cabinet post, and he's telling us as well that the Secretary of State sweepstakes is almost over. President-elect Trump asked John Kelly to run the Department of Homeland Security. That, according to the retired general. Kelly said this afternoon he would consider it an honor. Oklahoma Attorney General Scott Pruitt, who says he's not sold on the science of global warming, is the pick to run the EPA. World Wrestling Entertainment co-founder Linda McMahon is Trump's choice to top the Small Business Administration. And America's longest-serving Governor Terry Branstad will be the nominee for U.S. Ambassador to China. This has the list of Secretary of State possibilities that had been growing is now shrinking. I think I have in my own mind. I don't want to say which ones, but I think I have in my own mind. Time magazine named Trump its person of the year in part because the magazine says, quote, he identified the central issue motivating the American electorate and then convinced a plurality of the voters in the states that mattered that he was the best person to bring change. A lot has changed since last year when Mr. Trump was the runner-up and protested that, quote, I told you Time magazine would never pick me as the person of the year 
here, despite being the big favorite, they picked the person who is ruining Germany. The 2016 edition's cover photo shows Mr. Trump seated next to a banner calling him President of the Divided States of America, a description he does not care for. Putting divided is snarky, but again, it's divided. I, I'm not president yet, so I didn't do anything to divide. The soon-to-be 45th president got a visit today from the 44th president's first chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, who is currently mayor of a city Mr. Trump has repeatedly called out as violent and dangerous. Look at what's going on on in Chicago. It's horrible. Mayor Emanuel told reporters he met with Trump staffers about White House operations and separately stressed to the president-elect that he thinks the windy city benefits greatly from being a sanctuary city. I was clear about where I stood and other mayors stood on immigrants that we welcome them because they are achieving and, and striving for the American dream. Further coordination between Obama and Trump administration officials happened in D.C. today, where National Security Advisor Susan Rice met with her successor, retired Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, whose son was just fired from the transition team for his role sharing unproven conspiracy theories on social media. Inside Trump Tower today, visitors included recently defeated North Carolina Governor Pat McCrory, CKE Restaurant's CEO Andrew Puzder, and and former Dallas Cowboys coach Barry Switzer. I've been invited here to interview for the Secretary of Offense. <laughs> We've known for months that Mr. Trump has a very small circle of advisors, but it does sound like there is somebody new that he's listening to, and that's President Obama, who the president-elect said today he consulted with before naming some key cabinet slots. James? Peter Ducey outside Trump Tower in Manhattan. Peter, thank you. Hi, I'm Bill O'Reilly. Thanks for watching us tonight. Will Donald Trump be able to unite the country? That is the subject of this evening's Talking Points memo. Today, Time Magazine announced Mr. Trump is the person of the year. Then they took a swipe at him right on the cover saying, Donald Trump, president of the divided states of America. Time, perhaps the most politically correct publication in the country, clearly dislikes Mr. Trump. They had to make him person of the year. But obviously, they did not want to do that. However, the magazine is correct in saying that the USA is a divided country. Mr. Trump claims that happened on President Obama's watch, and he'll bring everybody together. Talking Points is not sure that's possible. To illustrate the point, let's take a look at the nation's largest city, New York. In the presidential election, Hillary Clinton received nearly 79% of the vote here. Donald Trump, 18%. Big Apple rock steady left. They remember that Trump actually said he might carry New York. That was never even remotely possible, and here's why. Unlike San Francisco, which is steeped in socialist ideology, New York City is basically a welfare state. The ethnic breakdown goes like this. 32% white, 29% Hispanic, 24% black, 14% Asian. You want diversity? Come to New York City. In addition, 38% of the population here is foreign-born, 17% not even citizens. So you are looking at a political situation where millions of New Yorkers are trying to survive in a very tough environment. Population of New York City is about 8.5 million, and many of them can't make a living. So the government must support them. Right now, New York City is approaching 100 billion dollars in debt. city cannot possibly pay off that money. So it'll borrow more and depend on you wherever you live to bail us here in New York out. 20% of New York City residents are now receiving food stamps. That's 1.7 million people at a cost of $250 million a month. A month. Other assistance to residents more than $100 million a month. 5% of the city's population is on disability. The cost, $252 million a month. Finally, 600,000 New Yorkers are receiving payments for public housing. That's 7% of the population. So you can see that New York City, the most powerful financial center in the world, is basically a dependency. And people receiving disability checks housing supplements, food stamps, and other direct payments are not going to vote for Republicans ever. So this is a one-party city that will never embrace a guy like Donald Trump. 
This is what America has come to. Its largest city falling apart. There's little desire on the part of the liberal city government here to lift people out of welfare. Liberal politicians actually want dependency. For example, if the city were to investigate disability claims, they'd find many of them are completely bogus frauds. It's a racket. Everybody knows it. But when 80% of the voters continue to support the far left vision, nothing is going to change. So even though Donald Trump is a hometown guy and believes he can bring America together, the heavy odds are he cannot. The welfare system in many places is simply too entrenched. And the welfare system is not going to make America great again. That's the memo. This evening, we continue our series on Donald Trump's first 100 days with a look at immigration. It was, of course, the issue that first put Trump's presidential campaign on the political map. Now, it will provide an early test of his willingness to stick to his promises. Correspondent Casey Stiegel reports tonight from the U.S. border with Mexico. Life just doesn't get much better than this for Eloisa Tamez. A leisurely stroll on her South Texas land once brought great joy. That is, until the neighbor arrived. The border wall is in my backyard. Long before President-elect Donald Trump's promise of a wall along the southern border, barriers actually started going up a decade ago, after President George W. Bush signed the Secure Fence Act of 2006. You see that big... Bump there. A towering 18 foot tall piece of that fence casts a shadow on Eloise's house. The land has been in her family for generations. It was a, a hopeless, hopeless feeling. Very emotional. Of the nearly 2,000 mile long U.S. Mexico border, about 670 miles is now walled or fenced. Congress never approved additional funding for more, and the program essentially went away. That was then. This is now. President elect Trump ran much of his campaign vowing to not only build along the entire border, but also make Mexico pay for it. However, some like Eloisa Tamez, who voted for Trump, don't have great confidence in how effective that'll be. More walls will not solve the problem. Aside from keeping people out, there's also the issue of what to do with those already living or staying here illegally. That was partially addressed when the president-elect on YouTube recently presented a plan for his first 100 days in office. I will direct the Department of Labor to investigate all abuses of visa programs that undercut the American worker. Something that's both celebrated and feared for industries that rely heavily on immigrant labor, like agriculture and construction. It's extremely difficult to get any kind of visa. Stan Merrick owns one of the largest construction companies in Texas. He's more than ready for reform. Merrick says right now... It's American businesses being punished for following the law, losing work to a growing number of outfits that skirt the rules by paying employees in cash and not coughing up taxes. Companies like mine cannot invest in a labor force unless we level the playing field. And Merrick's motto is the best border security is at a job site, meaning he believes President-elect Trump could be on the right track with holding employers accountable. U.S. Border Patrol agents have their work cut out for them. According to Customs and Border Protection, total apprehensions along the southwest border jumped nearly 24 percent this year compared to last. People are pouring in day and night. It's not uncommon for agents to nab more than a hundred immigrants in a single day and with a system already overburdened many are wondering can it handle any more? Deportation has been another contentious topic from Trump, initially calling for all illegal immigrants to be removed from America, now more focused on just kicking out violent criminals and repeat offenders. 
It's largely why the phones haven't stopped ringing at this immigration law firm in Dallas. There is a true fear. Attorney Martin Valco says he's spending a lot of time dispelling rumors and taking on new cases, but Valco points to a larger concern. He says there's not enough staff to handle a surge in deportation proceedings, considering the current average wait time for a new case is approaching two years nationally. He's going to have to crunch the numbers, see if they'll, have, if they'll be able to add that, that kind of number and number of judges. A daunting task, just like constructing a wall, but Eloisa Temes just wants to feel safe, wants the crime to stop. I want to matter. At the Texas-Mexico border, Casey Stiegel, Fox News. Tomorrow, we will look at some of the national security challenges awaiting President-elect Donald Trump when he takes office January 20th.